Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into vessels, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Have you understood all this? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of, out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Victor Austin wrote a book not to long ago called Losing Susan. It's about his wife's long battle with brain disease. Victor uh, was a priest and is a priest and theologian. He worked, uh, Andrew, you know him. He served at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue. You know him. Uh, actually, you know him. Uh, anyway, a lot of you know him. Uh, he's now in Dallas, Texas, serving as a theologian. He was supposed to be here in Lent, actually, to talk about his book and do some teaching with our new uh, widow's ministry. Uh, but in case you hadn't read about it or heard about it, there's this little thing called COVID <laughs> that's going around, and uh, that prevented his trip. Anyway, I'm trying to finish his book, but he has this thing where he keeps quoting from so many other wonderful books as I go along. Now I'm reading his book while I'm reading about six of the other books that he quotes simultaneously. I don't know if I'm the only person that does this. I, don't I probably won't get through with any of them. At one point, Father Austin quotes the Pulitzer Prize winning author Jeffrey Eugenides. And, who wrote, and Jeffrey wrote a book about 10 years ago, a short novel called The Marriage Plot. I'm about three-fourths into it. Uh, and it's really good. It's set in 1982, and it's basically about three Brown University seniors who've just reached their senior year at Brown, and they realize suddenly that they still haven't found themselves. Now, of course, you don't have to be a senior at Brown to identify with that, the idea of finding one's self. Mitchell Grammaticus, what a great name. Mitchell Grammaticus, a heretofore theology major, is fed up with what he sees as the extravagances and hypocrisy of the first world. And he decides that the only solution, the only way to find himself is to become the altruist extraordinaire. So he moves to Calcutta and he starts to work for Mother Teresa, 
tending the poorest of the poor. Now, the, the novel isn't a Christian novel. It's not even a religious novel, per se. But what Mitchell Grammaticus fails to realize in one tragic scene, it's one of the most tragic scenes in all of literature, what he fails to see has everything to do with one of the most essential and life-giving truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One day, one day, after many, many hard days, loving the least in a setting of unbearable filth and heat and rain, Mitchell is, Mitchell is confronted with a man who has, has defecated all over himself and is unable and too exhausted to clean himself. The scene is worse than you're already picturing in your mind. It's putrid squalor. Faced with that task, what does Mitchell do? Mitchell runs away. He buys a plane ticket home and he never returns. Later in the novel, he is perpetually tortured by his decision that he was unable to do what he thought he had the strength to do. Now, the first impulse, of course, after the scene, uh, you and I want to say, Mitch, old boy, you should have gone back to finish what you started. That's the nagging feeling that terrorizes him, after all. What really happened, however, is that Mitchell reached the end of his own strength, which I'm here to tell you, all of us already have at some point, or we will in the future. But that's not the heartbreak at all. The catastrophe is that nobody ever told him what a place of freedom and comfort that can be. Nobody ever told him that the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been about our strength. It's about his strength. Nobody ever told him that the good news of Jesus isn't for people who see themselves in the uh, theme song from Rocky, the movie, remember? Feeling strong now, won't be long now. Nobody ever told him that the gospel is for people that face things well beyond their strength all the time. Folks who are all shook up, to quote Elvis. People who face pandemics, legal problems, loneliness, divorce, substance abuse, broken relationships, and so forth. Nobody told him that those folks wake up singing tragedy by the Bee Gees. When the feeling's gone and you can't go on, it's tragedy. Nobody ever told him that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That is why it's a tragic scene. Have you ever reached the limits of your own strength? How did you handle it? When we were, <laughs> when we were on our honeymoon in Mexico, about 15 years ago, Malaysia and I decided to go for a swim down in the ocean. And as we walked toward the ocean, I noticed red flags and a sign that said, Danger. No swimming today. But hey, I was a newlywed, and I wanted to prove I had at least a modicum of strength and toughness. And I looked out, and I saw other people swimming. There didn't seem to be a problem. So I told Malaysia, come on, honey. Come on down. Don't worry about it. Promising that I can handle it. And, and of course, saying those famous words, honey, I would never let anything happen to you. Well, the next thing I know, one of those riptide deals you see on Discovery Channel. It jerked me out to sea with that current. I could not swim back to shore. Malaysia was, I looked over, she was struggling too. 
And so she grabbed a hold of me, which just made the situation worse. And with the last bit of strength, talk about limit of strength, with the last bit of strength I had, I took my feet and pushed her off of me and out into the sea, <laughs> praying that she could save herself. And that's a topic she still brings up from time to time. <laughs> And I'm serious, and, and then in about a time frame that it must have been less than two seconds, the, the current shifted again, and it, it sped up, and it deposited me back up on that seashore at about 20 knots like a beached whale. And as I got up with sand burn and barnacle and my swimsuits, my swim trunks were lower than they should have been, <laughs> there she is laughing on the shore. Safe, safe, safe. It turns out that I lacked the strength to be my wife's knight in shining armor. Mother Teresa wrote these words, I don't think there is anyone who needs God's strength and help as much as I do. Sometimes I feel so helpless and weak, and because I can't depend on my strength, I rely on him 24 hours a day. If the day had more hours, then I would need his strength during those as well. St. Paul told the Corinthians, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell upon me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Discovering, discovering the circumstances and moments in life that truly lie beyond our strength, beyond our limits, is actually and paradoxically a wonderful place to be. Far, far from despairing, Christians rejoice. We literally brag about it. That He is our strength. He is our righteousness. He is our sufficiency. You remember the old... Remember the old Sunday school song we all learned? It really still says it all. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so.